So hey there folks, it's me Smotown and I'm here with a lore video for Bloodborne and this time we are considering the Vile Bloods of Canehurst. Now the reason I wanted to do the Vile Bloods today is mainly because they're quite often overlooked as a lore point uh, as they just seem to fill the kind of vampire archetype in the game. Uh, while this is true to a certain extent, i.e. they chase for blood and they do imbue blood and ingest it indeed, uh, I think that their story is far deeper than this and uh, I'm going to talk about them um, because those that reside as the Lords of Castle Canehurst uh, also act as the antithesis of the, ch the church and obviously the executioners in particular um, and that's where I'm going to start the story. Uh, indeed the first mention that we get of the Lords of Canehurst is from Alfred who is in fact an executioner himself. Now, to fully understand this group, we must consider the two other main groups that are represented in the land of Bloodborne. And this is the group of scholars of Bargainworth and the Healing Church. The reason I say this is because to fully understand this often overlooked group, you must first look at the motivations of these main groups, and then contrast this with what we know about the Vile Bloods. Quite often, as I've said before, this group is simply categorised as the bad guy, the anti-church, the vampire, and I wish to rectify this, the view of this group, um, because actually, in my opinion, this group, can, uh, out of all the oaths that you can take, has the most depth to it, um, and is one that I think is probably the most worthwhile. Anyway, back to the motivations. All the groups are attempting to ascend to the level of Great Ones. We know this. Bargainworth attempt to do this through Master Willem's teachings. This man once said, We are thinking on the basis of planes. What we need are more eyes. The one third of umbilical cord tells us that he sought to line his brain with eyes in order to ascend. And indeed, we can see evidence of this in the fishing village where Bergenworth hunters attacked and forcibly searched the locals' heads for eyes. And indeed, you find the Gardens of Eyes within Bergenworth, which he clearly grew, or created, to grow eyes. This was not the method believed to be the best way of ascension by his, Lauren, by his pupil Lawrence. This man believed that the direct infusion of the Great One's blood was the way to ascension. And this is the story that Alfred tells us of the Healing Church. He tells us, Bergenworth is an old place of learning, and the tomb of the gods, carved out below Yarnum, should be familiar to every hunter. Well, once a group of young Bergenworth scholars discovered a holy medium deep within the tomb. This led to the founding of the Healing Church and the establishment of blood healing. In this sense, everything sacred in Yarnum can be traced back to Bergenworth. We therefore see that these two split from one another because of their differing, me differing methods and beliefs towards ascension. This led to the foundation of the Kainhouse clan, of the Kainhouse clan and of the Healing Church. Because Alfred tells us that one scholar took forbidden blood back to Kainhurst and began the vile blood clan. We can therefore see that while Lawrence took his, blo his blood to Yarnum, a rogue scholar took blood that was considered vile and forbidden for some reason to found the vile blood lords of Canehurst. Alfred paints them in quite a simplistic manner as vile fiends who are declared and dedicated enemies of the church. And while that is true in so much as they are opposed to the church, this is a far more simplistic demonization of the organization. I believe, in fact, that the vile blood that runs through the veins of the vile bloods is the blood of Queen Yarnum. And the vile bloods want to achieve what Queen Yarnum did many eons ago. But before I reach that conclusion, let's go over what we know of the Canehurst clan. We know from Alfred that they reside at Canehurst. And that this is a castle that we can see outside of Yarnum, just beyond Hemwick. The Knight's Set tells us that the Canehurst Way is a mix of nostalgia and bombast. 
they take great pride, even in the blood-stained corpses of beasts that they leave behind, confident that they will stand, uh, stand as examples of decadent art. We therefore get an insight into the culture of the Lord of Queenhurst. We know that much like medieval aristocracy, the Lords of Queenhurst take pride in formality and appearance. Indeed, this is reflected by the actual look of the knight's outfit, which is very decadent and formal. This formality is also reflected when you must approach the Queen. So she rebukes your advance if you directly confront her. Instead, she expects you to kneel before her some distance away and will call you uncouth if you do otherwise. In addition, if you show due deference, she will teach you the respect and deep respect gestures, which respect formality, formality and ceremony. In addition, they are nostalgic. And by this, I believe the Lords of Canehurst venerate those lords and ladies that came before them, which is very much a way of royal courts throughout history. Indeed, the ancient Roman aristocracy venerated their predecessors in an almost religious manner and honoured them with sculptures, sculptures and death masks. Throughout Canehurst, we see evidence of this nostalgia being manifest through a vast amount of sculpture and artwork, including painting, paintings and portraits, which no doubt is venerating the past lords of Canehurst. This is to lay claim to one's noble bloodline, which was everything to the aristocracy of days past. Indeed, bloodline is even more important to the nobles of Canehurst, especially when considered their blood is central to the aims and beliefs of the Canehurst organisation. We will look in detail at the vile blood when I talk about Yarnum herself. Just keep in mind that everything Canehurst believes in and wishes to achieve is linked to the blood that runs through their veins. We can also infer that the aristocracy of Canehurst appears to be a matriarchal society, or at least they recognise the importance of their queen to their aims. The reason I believe this is not only the fact they are ruled by a queen, but for other reasons linked to Yarnum, but I'll explain these ones later. We also encounter enemies within the castle known as Cain's servants, who appear to be all males, and they seem to be scrubbing the floors and maintaining the place, whilst the noble looking ghosts, which look like they are the remains of the noble aristocracy, are mostly f are all female in fact. Some of these cane servants wield the writer palash, which can offer us a deeper explanation. It states, Wielded by the knights of Canehurst, combines an elegant knight's sword with a peculiar firearm wielded by the Canehurst order. The old nobles, long-time imbibers of blood, are no strangers to the sanguine plague, and the disposal of beasts was a discreet task that was left to their servants, or knights, as they were called for the sake of appearances. We therefore can see that the knights, in inverted commas, of Canehurst were knights in name only for appearance sake, keeping up their kind of lordly appearance. And were in fact they were nothing more than servants and bagmen for the nobles of Canehurst. Although it is possible that females were also the servants and knights of Canehurst, we only seem to see males wielding this weapon while the noble looking ghosts are females. However, this just might be game design. There are more pieces of evidence that suggest that Canehurst is a matriarchal society. For one, the two other, apart from Queen Annalise of course, main figures that we meet that are linked to Canehurst are both female, and this is Ariana and Maria. We know Ariana is of Canehurst because of the clothing she wears. The description states, a finely tailored Bordeaux dress, worn by the nobles of the old bloodline that traces back to the forsaken castle Canehurst. Again we see reference to this bloodline. The vile blood is more than just an inheritance, it is a potent source of power. A power which the church despises and sees as heretical. We get more direct evidence that Ariana does indeed share this forbidden blood from her blood item that she can give us. It states, 
A member of the old healing church would know that her blood is similar, indeed, to precisely what was once forbidden, i.e. the forbidden blood that Alfred told us about. Although Ariana might not ever have lived amongst the Canehurst nobles, she is certainly a descendant of this bloodline, because there are two items that link her to it. Again, I will return to the blood later, but we get more evidence that she in, does indeed share the properties of a vile blood. Maria, on the other hand, aside from her blood, has almost nothing to do with Canehurst. In fact, it seems as though she's acti- actually aligned with the church, and she despises the use of blood weapons, which are a staple of the Canehurst armory. But as I said, it is interesting to note that three of the main characters that are linked to Canehurst are females. Again, suggesting, but not outright stating, a matriarchal society. And indeed, she is called Lady Maria, which again suggests her noble heritage. We therefore know that the Lords of Canehurst established themselves as a royal and noble bloodline, dedicated to preserving the bloodline that began with that forsaken blood. Their oath rune indicates, however, that this has led them to being declared heretics by the church. Several runes contain a nuance of blood, including the rune Corruption, associated with the Oath of the Corrupt. Pledgers to this oath are Canehurst Vilebloods, hunters of blood who find dregs for their queen in cold blood, particularly in that of hunters. Yet the corrupt are heretics in the eyes of the church, and thus subject to the wrath of the executioners. We therefore see that those who swear allegiance to the Vilebloods are subject to the wrath of the militia group, the executioners, and are viewed as heretical to the Yarnum Authority, or the Bloodborne Authority if you like. The subgroup that Alfred belongs to are called the Executioners, and their badge tells us that the Executioners are essentially a militia of religious fanatics who meet out their own religious judgement to those who are viewed as enemies of the church, and that they were led by a man named Logarius. We know that the Vilebloods must have had contact with the Executioners over the years because we can find the fact that there is an Executioner heirloom that has been kept as a treasure. This is the Executioner's glove. And we can see that this is considered to be a treasure of Canehurst. And in fact, the nobles referred to in the description are most likely the nobles of Canehurst who found amusement in this old Executioner artifact. Alfred tells us what became of the two groups when things came to a head. Master Lagarius led his executioners into Canehurst Castle to cleanse it of the vile bloods. But all did not go well, and Master Lagarius became a blessed anchor, guarding us from evil. Tragic. Things didn't go as planned, fair to say, and Martyr Lagarius never returned. However, the Logarius wheel tells us that these weapons were used to slaughter the slaughter the vile bloods, and it is forever steeped in their ire. Hence, why you can execute a curse mode when you have the wheel. We see evidence of the slaughter when we go to Canehurst ourselves. The bridge has been destroyed, and the castle is decrepit, with the courtyard filled with blood liquors feeding off the corpses of the dead. Clearly the majority of the nobles have been slaughtered because there are ghosts floating around with their their throats slashed and they still appear to be weeping as if in memory of what once was and or maybe of their brutal murder. However there is no sign initially of the Queen or of Ligarius until we reach the very roof and we are gauged by a creature that was once Ligarius but no more. He is keeping vigil upon the highest roof of Canehurst. Once we is killed, we can find his crown, which was one of the lost treasures of Canehurst's, and reveal what he was hiding, the immortal queen's chamber. She tells us that she is the last of the Vilebloods, and she has been imprisoned by the mask that she wears, and by Logarius himself. It is clear that Logarius and his men destroyed and slaughtered the Vilebloods, but realised the queen could not truly be killed. So he destroyed the bridge to the castle, imprisoned the queen, and hid her behind an illusion only he could see, and thus martyring himself 
to watch over the Queen for eternity. However, the Queen never dies, and she endeavours to break this imprisonment through us, the Hunter. An invitation finds its way to you, calling you to Canehurst at her behest. Despite the fact the bridge is no more, this invitation for some reason grants you the ability to ride a carriage. Again, this reflects the bombacity or pomposity of the Canehurst, and this takes you right to the gates of Canehurst. However, when you step off the carriage and look around, you can see that the horses have been dead for many years, and that the cart could not have possibly ran. This once again reflects the power of the Queen. She seems to have some ability to do with time as well, but there's no real evidence for this beyond this and her resurrection. Once you defeat Logarius, you can have an audience with the Immortal Queen. She makes you kneel and asks whether you want to join her blood. If you imbibe her blood, you will drink the ancient blood of Yarnum and will become a vile blood, Othrun or no. And this is exactly one of the reasons I love this group. Your allegiance to the vile bloods runs over deeper than just an Othrun that you can take off when you go back to the Hunter's Dream. It runs as deep as your blood, which will irreversibly be corrupted if you accept her offer. The true power of the Queen isn't revealed until the story of the Executioners comes to an end. You can get Al- give Alfred an unaddressed invite to Canehurst, which allows him to travel there, and he will finish Logarius' work by beating the Queen to quite literally a pulp. After this, it appears he kills himself, or lets himself die, it doesn't really matter, because he believes his mission is complete. The executions obviously deserve their own video, but let's suffice it to say that Alfred is fairly short-sighted, and he's overly fanatical, and doesn't see the greater picture that perhaps maybe Logarius did. Because the Queen can be revived by the player if you are loyal to the Queen. You can bring her flesh, which is still alive, to the Altar of Sorrow. Using the power of the Great Ones to revive her. Time has some factor involved here. It reverses her to the state that she had before. Beyond this, we can't really say how the Queen is revived. However, it is clear that even when she is a pile of flesh, she is undead. With that large amount of background done, it's time to get to the meat of what it means to be a vile blood, and why I believe Queen Annalise is a living vessel for Yarnum's blood. We know that the Queen was not only served by her knights, but she was also protected by her royal guard, as we can see from the Canehurst armour description. We also know that the vile bloods had a very unique armoury, which drew upon blood powered weapons such as the Evelyn and Chicago which makes sense considering their very distinct and dangerous blood. We also know that the powder kegs attempted to copy the writer Palash's unique hybrid sword gun design, but failed ending up only with the rifle spear, which is in fact, despite its description, an extremely good weapon. The vile bloods have also had a lot of contact with the beastly scourge, as mentioned by the writer Palash, because they are long time imbibers of blood, much like the Yarnamites. And we know that this was the task of the knights, to clean up the mess left behind. The knights set also highlights the fact that Canehurst hunters took pride in their work, seeing the corpses of their victims as de- de- examples of decadent art. This suggests that the vile bloods, despite their unique vile blood, still use healing blood, and therefore still have to deal with the beastly scourge. We can see that this is the case, especially since you can RP as a vile blood and you still heal using blood. However, as with everything, the vile bloods keep to their formal ways, seeing the slaughter of beasts as a chance to produce some wonderful art. We know that from the Canehurst badge, that Annalise is the supreme authority of Canehurst, because it states, Badge of the Royal Guards of Canehurst, Loyal Guardians of the Vile Blood Queen, Annalise. The vile bloods are hunters of blood, and hunt prey as they search for blood dregs. The hunter who joins them is faced with a decision, to merely borrow their strength, or to become one of them heart and soul. Uh, I will obviously touch on the fact that you get rewarded with her blood later, but it's worth mentioning now. I believe what this means is to borrow their strength is just to take her initial offer, and therefore gain access to their armoury and their support. To become one of them heart and soul, 
is to hunt dregs like a vile blood hunter. And once you hand over those dregs, you are rewarded with the queen's blood. And therefore, the more blood you imbibe, the more vile blood you become. And the more you become them heart and soul. The royal guards therefore serve her specifically, although it appears she may have had a consort once. There is a seat next to her, and if you propose to her, she'll tell you that there is no need for a consort, but more importantly, she doesn't want any harm to befall you. This suggests that she once had a consort, but that be by being her consort, harm befell them as it would to you. With this said, it is now time to explain why this would be, and why I believe her to be a vessel of Queen Yarnum's blood. Well, first of all, the very name Vile Blood suggests that the blood is harmful and corrupting. Indeed, when you eventually fight Yarnum, she uses her harmful and poisonous blood as a weapon. Also, the language used when describing both Queen Yarnum, i.e., her horrific consciousness as described by the Yarnum Stone, and the Vile Bloods describing their vile, corrupting blood, semantically are semantically similar which draws more parallels between the two bloodlines. Thirdly, they are both immortal. We have already seen that despite the fact Queen Annalise is beaten to a pulp, her queenly flesh remains are still alive. And when you kill Yarnum, the Yarnum Stone tells us, The queen lies dead, but her horrific consciousness is only asleep, and it stirs in unsettling motions. We can therefore see that despite the fact that the Queen's body is dead, she is immortal and her intelligence will never fade. Indeed, those of vile blood also share in this power, but to a lesser degree, for they can regenerate health when they are near death. Annalise and Yarnum are both also Queens, no doubt being elevated to this position due to their venerated blood, and thus their importance in their respective society. It also was heavily suggested that Yarnum once had a child that was taken from her, most likely Murgo, as some kind of offering to the Great Ones. This is implied because Yarnum looks like she's heavy with child, or she has just given birth to child. She also has blood radiating from her stomach slash uteral area, as if a child has been forcibly torn from her, or she has had difficulty giving birth or given birth to something inhuman, in fact. In addition, we see a version of Yarnum crying outside of the room in the Nightmare of Mensis, where the baby is crying. Whether this is a uh, Murgle's cries, or another baby being offered by Mensis, we cannot say. However, once we silence these cries and end Murgle's wet nurse, Yarnum stops weeping and shows a gesture of respect despite the fact that she is aggressive and quote-unquote evil when we next meet her in the Chalice Dungeons. We can infer from this that Yarnum lost her child to the Great Ones, whether it be Margot or not. The betrothal ring found in her realm of Thamuro Ihil states, The inhuman beings known as Great Ones imbued this ring of betrothal with some special re meaning. In the age of the Great Ones, wedlock was a blood contract only permitted to those slated to bear a special child. Now this is extremely insightful, if you'll excuse the pun, and bear with me a minute as I explain where I'm going with this. Yarnum was clearly one of these people slated to bear a special child for the Great Ones, or with the Great Ones. The Sumerians lived in the time of the Great Ones, and clearly had more direct contract with them, and they marked chosen Sumerians to bear their children, for we know from the from the one third of umbilical cord. Yarnum was chosen, and this was clearly seen as a great honour in her society, and so she was elevated to queen. And she bore a great one's child as per the blood contract described by the Ring of Patrol though. That doesn't mean she didn't regret losing her child to a great one, or that the birth was, the, the birth was clean. Hence why she is seen weeping and in her current bloody state. It's possible she even died on childbirth. Whether she was married to a great one or an approved consort, it doesn't really matter. What does matter is she bore a child specifically for the great ones. And it is this process that is clearly seen as heretical by the church and why they view the blood as vile. 
and indeed it is it's so dangerous that Yarnum wields it as a weapon. However, one scholar clearly saw this as an easier way to ascension and took the blood to Canehurst and founded Annalise's line. Annalise's vile blood hunters are attempting to help her achieve what Yarnum did all those years ago. The vile blood hunt for blood dregs, and only they can see them in the blood of echo fiends, or hunters, much like only the confederates can see vermin. The description of the dreg states, Queen Annalise partakes in these blood dreg offerings, so that she may one day bear the child of blood, the next vile blood heir. This makes it pretty clear that the vile bloods hunt other hunters for these powerful artifacts of blood, so that she may too be prepared to bear a child of blood, much like Yarnum once did. Not only this, but it seems that Annalise rewards her hunters, as I mentioned, by letting them imbibe more of her own blood, and therefore to become more vile blood. The Canerst armour also suggests that this was a task of the vile blood hunters. This is where we return to Ariana, who we can infer has the vile blood, and she later seems to give birth to a celestial child. The Odin, rune, the Odin runes and her location in Odin Chapel suggest that Odin the Formless is the one that impregnated her, and she has given birth to her their child. We can see that the blood was also messy, like Yarnum's, because we follow a distinct flow of blood to her location. This again highlights the fact that those who share the vile blood, Yarnum's blood, are the ideal vessels for a great one's child. In this respect, the vile bloods are the bloodlusting hunters, because, but they are not the simplistic ones that the blood. They aren't the simplistic ones that Alfred suggests, because they are attempting to complete an ancient ritual started by the Thumerians, rather than just drinking blood like vampires. This is why the game is so clever to me because it, the church convinces foot soldiers like Alfred's that the vile bloods are just blood lusting evil beings who kill for killing's sake and are the antithesis of the good healing church. But not only this, it can actually convince and mislead the player that this is actually the case, which really highlights the fact that the NPCs of this world don't just talk as the developers would talk, but as their own unique character with their own beliefs and prejudices, and they can also mislead the player probably on purpose. The truth is Annalise and her order are hunting the blood of powerful hunters or blood blood fiends, echo fiends, uh, and they're looking for blood dregs which are the result of echoes being imbued through a hunter and then torn from them by vile blood hunters. This distillation process results in blood, the blood dregs which Annalise needs to prepare herself for the process that Yarnum underwent all those years ago to bear a child of blood. This blood, along with her vile blood, will one day allow her to bear the child much like Yarnum did. And it seems that Ariana is an indicator of this, because she seems to have a celestial child. Although we can't be sure that the celestial child is the absolute pinnacle of their blood, we can be certain that it is indicative of the potential of vile blood. Well, thanks guys for sticking in with me while I took on you down a winding path there. Um, but I hope I've changed your opinion about this very interesting group. They have a lot to offer, and they aren't just the blood-sucking vampire archetypes, but they are just another faction using a different method than the church to gain ascension. For me, they are the most interesting oath faction in the game, because their backstory goes back eons, and they actually shed some light, if you look at it carefully, on Queen Yarnum, who actually doesn't have that much of an explanation in the game. So simultaneously, we get a story for Yarnum and Annalise. So, thanks again guys for watching this video, I hope you enjoyed my perspective on the Vile Bloods. Uh, after I've thought more about these connections and about the Oath in general, I certainly gain more enjoyment from playing as this Covenant in game. So feel free to subscribe if you like my content, uh, and guys get out there and get some dregs for the Immortal Queen of Undeath. For the Queen!